Welcome, folks, to another episode of That Anita Live, emotional healing to help you create a happier life. I'm Anita, your host, and this week we're discussing how to rebuild after brokenness. After your life has fallen apart, how do you dust yourself off and start to rebuild a beautiful life? Tania Pear, my guest today, knows the feeling of being lost and alone. She's one of six authors in a new collaborative book titled Women Who Overcome and she's here to share her story with us today. Her story of overcoming depression and learning to thrive after back-to-back -back tragedies. Welcome to Nia Perry to the show. What's up, T? Hey. How are you? I'm well. <laughs> How's your weekend going? <sighs> weekend is pretty good so far. Thank you very, very much for coming down here to talk to us today. Yeah. Let's, let's break down your story. Okay. And let's start from, let's say, you grew up in a single parent household. Yes. And just you and your mom. But you mentioned in your book that as a child, you felt neglected. Yes. You felt rejected. Why is that and how? Who did you feel rejected by? Um, well, actually I'm the oldest of five. Um, in the household, there was a total of four of us that lived together. Um, but I felt neglected from my mom. I felt um, neglected from my dad. My dad left when I was probably two months old. Okay. So um, I experienced a lot of being the oldest, of being uh, my mom's backbone, of being the, just the one to just take on a lot of responsibilities at a young age. So I felt emotionally neglected. My mom was present in the household but because she was so young, my mom didn't really understand what it meant to be a nurturing, a nurturer, mm -hmm. or um, just to be active, hands-on as much as I really needed her to, mm -hmm. because she didn't know. My mom had me at 15. So you can imagine a high school, you're in high school, you're, you know, you're a teenager, you're getting to understand yourself, and then here you are, you're pregnant. So, um, a lot of my years, I lived with my mom, but she was present, but just, she wasn't so now there. How, how does she feel about you now telling your story? My mom is supportive, extremely supportive. And I say that because my, even through my transitions, my mom went through a life transition as well to where she's looking at life differently. Mm -hmm. She's actually, we've sat down several times together and talked about my childhood. And we talked about what Go ahead. happened and- Was there anything that you shared with her that she found shocking? Like, oh, I didn't, I didn't know that. She did, um, as far as the, when I was a child and I slept with cords around my neck. 11 years old. Yes, she did not know about that. What pushed you to that point at 11, at 11, to, to not want to live anymore? I felt like, I felt like a failure. I felt alone. I felt that- How do you feel like, like a failure at 11? Like what specifically did you evaluate on yourself or that you were doing that you felt like a failure? Um, I took a lot on when it came to my dad, with my dad not being in my life. Mm -hmm. So even though I took on the role as the oldest, I took on the role as a older sister, I still felt like I, I was a failure because my dad wasn't there. Mm -hmm. I okay. felt that I wasn't good enough. I felt that um, I was a mistake, regardless of all that I'm you know, balancing my, with my dad not being there and also knowing that he had another family. I felt like a failure. I felt like there was no reason for me to continue to live. However, the only thing that kept me was my brother. Because when I say that I was my mom's backbone. Mm -hmm. and, a, my, and a lot of children in that first part, that oldest child, a lot of them experience being the responsible ones. Yes. 
in having to take on that second parenting responsibility because there is just one parent in the house. Yes. And so it's my brother, the more I, I remember at 11 years old, I've slept, I slept several nights with cords around my neck, but this one particular night I looked over at my brother and I was just in tears. And that was the last time that I slept with a cord around my neck. And I remember it like it was yesterday. Did he say anything to you? No, nope. my, my brother knew absolutely nothing about that. He knew absolutely nothing about my depression. Do you think you felt like, oh, I can't leave him? Right. Ah. Right. Because you took care of him a lot. Yes. Wherever I went, <laughs> <laughs> my brother was there. So I supported my brother to, like, that was, that was my life. So from 11 into your teens, yes. you mentioned you look for love in all the wrong places. Mm -hmm. Define that for me. I looked for validation of being wanted, of being um, just accepted. And all that I knew was from what I saw and what I experienced, um, you know, just in a community and also with closer rel relatives that, you know, weren't married or were young and everything. Um, and so I, you know, as a teenager, you, you begin to um, have attractions to guys. <laughs> Y'all see how careful she be in with this? She is the good clinician now. She's the <laughs> mental health clinician, clinician now. So she being real educated with us. <laughs> Girlfriend hit the clubs, huh? Like, tell, talk okay. to me and talk to us. Oh, absolutely. Okay. okay, so I was slowly walking my way into the teenage young adult <laughs> years. But if we want to go, okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Mm -hmm. So, um, because we learn best from each other. Absolutely. And a lot of the times when we speak in our educational tones, mm -hmm. we leave out mm -hmm. those that are coming behind us mm -hmm. or those that are still out there. Right. Because they don't get the language. They still doing hood language. Mm -hmm. And we have to give them, you know, that experience that we were there yeah. too. Oh. Absolutely. <laughs> and I, I'm, I'm just slowly trying to make our way into that because this is it is a very deep, deep area. So mm -hmm. I was just going from, you know, childhood up until mm -hmm. that age. Um, so, of course, definitely in high school, um, you know, I lost my virginity at a very young age. And it was with a gentleman that, you know, I thought that we would be together forever. This is the first actual relationship that I ever had. And I felt like that was the closest thing to just feeling whole. I looked for a man to make me complete or to make me feel like I was worth anything. So in that relationship, it opened the door to, you know, having sex. Mm -hmm. And so um, in that it opened up the emotional attachments and it opened up, my grades were failing. My grades, it was just, my mind was just like, oh my gosh, this dude, this dude, that was all that I, you know, knew. Mm -hmm. And so when that ended, then that opened up more relationships and I was in, in the clubs. I was in, you know, into guys and, you know, having, you know, sex and everything. But there was still something that just, for some reason, I, there was still a balance or a level. Some, something in me just kept, in all of the things that I've done, mm -hmm. It kept me together and I just could never understand it. Even my friends, they would say to me, T, you're so different. You're so different. I'm like, do you think it was taking on so much responsibility at such an early age? Yes. I think in that it made me mature a little more and it made me, um, though I wanted to have sex, though I wanted to be in a relationship regardless of what it caused me, regardless of the hurt and pain that it caused me, there was still something that I wanted different. Welcome to That Anita Live TV on YouTube. Here at That Anita Live, I share episodes about emotional healing to help you create a happier life. 
How do I do that? Through awareness, education, and most importantly, you, the community. By sharing tips and techniques from real people with real stories of overcoming trauma and abuse to live relentless lives. Hanging out with me, you'll laugh, you'll learn, but most importantly, you'll heal. Never miss a moment. Subscribe to That Anita Lives YouTube channel today. Subscribe via thatanitalive.com forward slash YouTube. And we're back with Tania Pear sharing her story of depression and suicide. Tell me about the time you and your mom had to tussle because your mom was trying to stop you mm -hmm. from stabbing yourself in the mm -hmm. stomach. Um, so my, my mom and I really can't remember the exact, what sparked our conversation, mm -hmm. um, but I'm sure that it, had, it pertained to either, maybe it was discipleship class or something. It was just a, a, bar, a number of things that we were kind of going through throughout that year. Um, and I, I was upset with her about not supporting me in my discipleship. And we could have very well had a program or something coming up. And I just really wanted her to be there. And um, she. Because you were like, Ma, I need you to want, I want you to come with me. I want you to be, be with me at church. I want you to see everything that I am getting involved in. And she was like, child, thank you, Madonna. Yeah, yeah. I've seen church. Uh. <laughs> And so my mom, the good thing, my mom understands she knows who Christ is. Mm -hmm. um, however, because my mom has been such a workaholic since the age of 15, it's like work, 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 work. And so I told her, I said, you know, I'm doing this to better myself. And I went through months of this training and there were several times my mom went ask how, how was class, how did things go? And I just felt like I, once again, I'm not supported and I'm doing this to better my life spiritually. And so um, I'm sure that I asked her about attending the program and she's, you know, I can't go, you know, my schedule, my time. And I said, Ma, this is early in the morning, you can come. Well, I need, I need to go to sleep or I need to, you know, prepare myself for work and I felt I was just at my, like the lowest, I was just at the end. I didn't care, I was, we were probably screaming at each other. Um, I was, um, it was a lot going on and so I ran to the kitchen and she ran up, ran behind me and I grabbed the knife and I was just ready to just, just go. I didn't care, I didn't care about anything else at that moment because I was just so tired of, the years of lack of support. And I'm not only doing this for me, I'm doing this for our family because I see the continued generational curses. I can, I can see the continued patterns. And so I went through that process to, to save my family, to save my mom. Like I said, my mom is, I was her backbone. So what she goes through, I go through. Mm -hmm. What she's struggling or, you know, trying to battle or trying to overcome, I'm there like every step of the way with her. And so I just felt once again neglected. I felt like there was no support. And she grabbed the knife and I'm just screaming and crying and I'm breathing probably about to pass out. And she sat me down and I told her, I was like, you know, Ma, I'm really trying. I'm really trying to, you know, I'm trying to get my life together and I just want you to be there for me. And I told her, I said, you weren't there for me in my childhood. Like, can you at least just be here for me? And she said, you know, I'm sorry that I wasn't the best mom. I'm sorry that I neglected you. I'm sorry that, and then it was times that she would say, you know, I'm sorry that I'm the world's worst mom. And I said, no, you're not, but I just need you. I need you to be here for me. And, um, and we sat and talked for several hours after that, and I went on to the program. Did she become more supportive after that? No. It took some time. It really took some time. So, so what do you think was that, that breaking point that actually began to break the ice for her to become more supportive of you? Mm. Honestly, I would say 
the day that I graduated with my master's, that's when I started to notice a change in the support. Um, but in the process of this book, mind blowing. My mom's support for me has like gone to like this high level and I was just, you know, thank you God that you even allowed her. She called into the radio station and cried. My mom never cries. And it was such a powerful moment because this is, it was like, you know, God, this is, I went through this mm -hmm. just so that she can see the change in me, so that she can see to be a little more compassionate. And that's one of the things that I prayed, you know, about regarding my mom, help her to help me first to love my mom the way that, you know, my prayer. And I mentioned in the book, um, the three days that I stayed in my car and I prayed, I said, God, help me to love my mom the way that you want me to. I can't, me trying to love my mom the way I wanted to, it's like a, I'm fighting trying to pull something that I may never get. Right. But I have to love and see my mom on an entire another level in order for us to come together. And, um, and so I would say, you know, when I graduated, she was extremely proud of me because that was a major accomplishment. She's- Now that was in 2016. Yes. All right. So let's go back to 2014, mm -hmm. where you experienced back-to-back -back tragedies, one right after mm -hmm. the other. Mm. You were terminated from your job. Yes. Totaled your car. Yes. And then failed to graduate on time. Well, I failed an um, exam. How did you deal with one tragedy after other. When you were terminated from your job, did you think, okay, this is it, I'm on a landing, let me catch my breath? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's funny because 2014 was the time that I um, went, I rededicated my life back to Christ. Mm -hmm. So I went through the challenges of um, depression. I went through that year was like the dark, one of the darkest years for me. Um, that was the year that I was actually diagnosed with major depression. Mm -hmm. um, and so I went through so much that year to where I was just, I was prepared and ready for whatever was to come the following How year. did you get diagnosed with depression? So um, I actually went to a counselor. I went to a counselor and I did that because I, I had a, a major breakdown during my internship. And it just felt like I couldn't focus. I couldn't like retain the information. I couldn't remember things. Now I was just so, I was just thinking, what is wrong with me? And I was still at that time waking up every day upset, waking up depressed and remind you I'm working with youth and counseling. And so the day that I had the major breakdown, um, I spoke about it, I talked to my supervisor and I was very upfront and I told her, I said, this is what's going on and I need help. I cannot be effective in this field or be effective in someone else's life when I have so much going on with myself. And in that, once again, the population that I love so much pushed me to go get, to get help, to seek help because I felt like I would be doing a disservice. That's how much I care about empowering people. Mm -hmm. I cannot, you cannot operate from anything or help anybody when you're dealing with so much stuff. You can't be, you can't be present with them. And so um, that pushed me to seek help. Um, I went to a um, counselor. We had several sessions. We were about, I think maybe about three or four sessions. And um, I went to a group had group therapy um, and there was just something I was like I just need to be in prayer I need to be home not saying that I felt like I was too good to go to counseling um, but there was more there was something more and I also had my discipleship class at the church so it was more so of a group setting um, and that was in December and I just remember that night just praying and I laid and I, you know, I prayed about everything that was going on and 
I had people in, in, that were in my life that were coaching me and helping me get through my challenges. And then 2015 hit, and that's when I was terminated. And so in the termination, that's the first time that I've ever been fired from a job. And um, I said, okay, took my badge off, you know, went through the paperwork and everything, and I cried. I said, I am, I just went through the depression stages and acknowledging what was going on with me. Is this really happening yeah. again? And um, I really like, I looked at, I just remember driving in my car, leaving, leaving the airport. And I was just thinking, okay, I cannot dwell in this. I have to keep going because I do not want, what happened in 2014, I should not be here. There were multiple times when I wanted to drive my car off the road, when I wanted to, you know, I took multiple, the pills that were prescribed to me Mm -hmm. I took multiple depression. yes I took multiple pills because I was just still like 2014 was the one of the darkest years for me um and so I you know I was terminated and I, I just thought you know I was a, a, examining my life this is my last year of grad school I have my internship I have these various things and I started to think I couldn't stay in that area of knowing I just left my job, I have to keep going. So I looked at the time that I would have to focus on, you know, my internship and completing school. And um, and the next thing you know, a few months later, I totaled my car. And I'm just like, okay, let's go. We have to keep going. We have mm -hmm. to keep going. Mm -hmm. Because you stay, the thing of it is, when you go through depression and you go through those stages, when you first acknowledge that this is an issue and you take those necessary steps, be it group therapy, be it, you know, being involved in different activities. It's like training grounds for you to get to try to bring some sort of wholeness or understanding to everything that's going on. And that prepared me for everything that was preparing to happen in 2015, because had I not fully acknowledged what was going on with me, um, and also going through those things and not completely giving up, um, you know, I wouldn't, have, I wouldn't have been able to, what do they say, bounce back. From Was there one job. particular technique that helped you uh, manage your way out of being in, in a depressive state? Um, I just, honestly, I thought about my future. I really just thought about my goals, I thought about my life, just everything that I experienced and how much I've overcome, mm -hmm. even as a child. And and then of course I had my church family as well. So that that is what really kept me. Yeah. That is what really kept me throughout those times from one people praying for me, my pastors praying for me. Um, and just talking about it, just really being upfront and honest about everything that's going on. Because when you're depressed, you, it's just always eternalized, internalized. You keep it in. And sometimes you feel afraid to talk about it. You feel ashamed to talk about it. So I was in a place where I could just talk and just say, this, this is what I'm going through. These are the things that I'm experiencing. And so- And the environment that you, that you were in was very nurturing absolutely. and understanding. Yes. And you're mentioning that, that environment you're talking about is your church environment. Yes. And that is First Baptist of Highland, Highland Park. Highland Park. Yes. And Pastor Davis is straight, <laughs> straight with it. No sugar coats. You mentioned it in, in his chapter. You talk about forgiveness a lot. Mm -hmm. And you talk about it is important to know what love is before running after it. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Um, it's important because <laughs> when you run after something just based off of how you've seen it or acknowledged it, especially if it came from a place where there wasn't a steady foundation, where there wasn't a positive example, you'll begin to operate just based off of that, of what you've seen. And so the way that you see love, you may receive it differently. You may receive it you may think it from, and I'm going to say from myself, um, 
just someone wanting to be around you or, oh, you're so beautiful or you're so, you know, this and that, but then it's like, they're gone, you know, the mm -hmm. next day. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's important to know love. You can't, love is peaceful. Love is special. Love is understanding. Love is joyful. Love is, um, it's happiness. It's just, when you don't know what it is, you run after what you've seen in the media. You run after what you've seen in your peers. And it could be the wrong, absolutely wrong thing. And then you find yourself in, in a situation where you're confused, you're lost, you feel, you're empty. So, because mm -hmm. what you write in your book is, I was angry, depressed, alone, ostracized, had low self-esteem, suicidal, empty, dark, lost, and in my eyes, pathetic. Mm -hmm. So now, how did you get from here to where you are now? Hmm. I tell you, that spiritual walk, when I said yes to following God, when I said yes to just letting go of my past, I'll never forget my past, but I let it go to where I no longer felt like I was obligated to remain there, or I felt like I was obligated to just take on the baggage completely. Mm -hmm. I was able to just release it. And my relationship with God truly changed my entire life. Had it not been for First Baptist of Highland Park discipleship class, I would not be here today. I would not be the woman that's like, on fire for God is like <laughs> empowering people just and then excited about sharing my story I would not be how do you feel about yourself now <laughs> did you see that face <laughs> did you see that face when I said how do you feel about yourself now did you see mm. your face just lit up I feel he I feel powerful I feel that Mm. It's just, <sighs> wow. No matter what you've been through or what you may be currently going through, whether or not you get off the spin cycle of despair is a decision. And only you can make that choice. You can start by reaching out to your local crisis center you can reach out to First Baptist of Highland Park or your local church. You can reach out by dialing the National Crisis Hotline at 800-273-TALK, which is 800-273-8255. Because we know sometimes you don't want to be fixed, you just want to be heard. If you'd like to learn more about Tania Pear, find her on Instagram at Tania M. Pear. Make the commitment to start your journey to emotional healing today. I'm Anita, your host. Be sure to check thatanitalive.com for where and when to see our next episode.